This book is about Noah Webster. Now, those of you who know me, you know that I am a word nerd. I love words. I think about words. So this is a very exciting book. So this is called Noah Webster. This is the, well, I'm not going to tell you who he is. I kind of gave you a little clue when I told you that I loved words and I was a word nerd, but um, let's see if you can figure out. This is called Noah Webster and his words. And it's written by Jerry Chase Ferris and illustrated by Vincent X. Kirsch. Now I am trying to go to the next page. <clears throat> it has a dedication page. For my sons, Tom and Mark, who always know the right words. And that is from the author. To Kathy Milne, who has a way with words. Noah Webster. Let's do this. <clears throat> Noah Webster always knew he was right. And he never got tired of saying so even if sometimes he wasn't. He was, he said, full of confidence. Noun, a belief that one is right from the beginning. His huge head. He was born in 1758 on a farm in West Hartford, Connecticut, when America still belonged to England. And by the time he was 12, he knew how to grow everything from beans and corn to peas and potatoes. His father said Noah would be a fine farmer, following in the footsteps of a long line of Webster families. Look at those beautiful fields. But Noah did not want to be in that long line. He did not want to be a farmer at all. Noah wanted to be a scholar, which is a noun, one who goes to school, a person who knows a lot. He wanted to study Latin and Greek. His father said that he could if he did all of his work on the farm too. It wasn't long before Noah's father found him with a nose in a book and his work not done. Red haired Noah was red-faced with embarrassment, which is a noun, and it means shame and confusion. Now, you notice all these words, embarrassment, and these dashes in between them, these are showing the different syllables, embarrassment. And then in the brackets, it tells the part of speech. It says, first, it's a noun, and then it tells us, it defines the word, it gives the definition. Embarrassment means shame or confusion. Mr. Webster went to see Noah's teacher, the Reverend Perkins. Reverend Perkins convinced, verb overcame by argument, Mr. Webster, that Noah should be in school, not on the farm. So when Noah was 15, he entered Yale, one of the best colleges in the country. There was only one problem. Yale was expensive. Adjective, having a high price, costly. Mr. Webster got a loan on the farm to pay the bill. Noah promised to pay him back. When Noah graduated from Yale in 1778, the Revolutionary War, which had started in 1775, was still going on. What should he do? Join the army? Study law? Return to farming? He owed his father a lot of money and he had to get a job fast. He decided he knew enough to be a good teacher.
That fall, Mr. Noah Webster, age 19, began teaching school. Like many teachers then, he had no blackboard, no chalk, no pencils or maps. A blackboard is a chalkboard, and before whiteboards, that's what we used to use. He did have lots of students and a few old school books from England. But Noah wanted to teach his students about America. He wanted American school books. Hmm. Because remember, at this time, America was a new country. It was just, they, they were trying to get their freedom from, um, America was new. And remember, it was a British colony. So it was really important to Noah that he didn't have things that came from England. He wanted things from America. In October 1781, King George soldiers, King George, okay. In October 1781, King George's soldiers surrendered, which is a verb, it gave up, at Yorktown. So King George was the king of England at that time. The war was over at last. America was free and independent. Adjective, not controlled by others. That gave Noah an idea. He would write the school books for America, beginning with spelling. I will write the second declaration of independence, Noah wrote to a friend, an American spelling book. After all, now that America was free from in after all, now that America was free from England, why should Americans spell the way they did in England? For example, in England, plow was spelled P L O U G H. Also, Americans were spelling words any way they wanted. So the same word might be spelled 10 different ways. Mosquito, 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 mosquitor, muscator, in 10 different places. Mosquitoes were very big at that time. Noah thought Americans should spell every word the same way every time, everywhere. This would unite verb to make one, the United States. Hmm. For almost two years, Noah taught all day and worked on his speller at night. When the book was finished, the publisher, a noun, one who prints an author's work, of the Connecticut Current newspaper printed it. Noah wanted his new spelling book to look different from all other books on the shelves. So he told his printers to put a blue cover on it. That way people could just ask for the blue backed speller. The speller cost a lot, 14 cents, but it soared, verb, flew, off the shelves like an American eagle. Noah's book not only taught spelling, but also listed important American dates, towns, and states. At last, in 1783, an American school book. Noah was very happy with his book, but he still had little money because he only received one penny for each copper sold. I'm sorry, he, Noah was very happy with his book, but he still had little money because he only received one penny for each copy sold. The printer got the rest. In 1784, his second book was published, a grammar, noun, study of words, rules for using words, book. I love grammar. In 1785, his third book was published, a reading book. The printers were getting rich. Noah was not. Noah worried about his bills, and he worried about America. There was no president. Each of the 13 states had its own money and made its own rules. 
Noah was afraid America would fall into 13 pieces. We ought not to think of ourselves as people. Of one, Noah worried about his bills and he worried about America. There was no president. Each of the 13 states had its own money and made its own rules. Noah was afraid America would fall into 13 pieces. We ought not to think of ourselves as people of one state, he wrote, but as Americans. He decided to go to every state and talk about his books and his ideas. He went north, south, east, and west. He gave his books to teachers and he gave lectures, noun, a talk to an audience, to everyone. Now is the time. This is the country, Noah roared. Let us establish a national language and government. He liked that part best. He said it as often and loudly as he could. In Philadelphia, Noah met Rebecca Greenleaf. He was soon reciting in his diary about the most lovely Rebecca, and before long they were married. Over the next 10 years, Noah wrote six more school books for children and had several children of his own. He also started a magazine and newspaper so he could tell Americans about their new government. Alas, this turned out to be too much writing, even for Noah Webster. Noah gave up on the magazine and newspaper business. He settled his family in New Haven, Connecticut and wrote more school books. People all over the country were buying his books, especially the blue-backed speller. And finally, Noah had some money. He's worked really hard. He also had a big idea. He would write a dictionary. Noun a book listing words in ABC order, telling what they mean and how to spell them. Two small dictionaries had been printed in America before this, but with English spellings. Noah's dictionary would be 100% American, the first American dictionary. He planned to explain every word in the English language, every word, including new American words such as skunk, dime, and tomahawk, noun, an Indian hatchet. After all, he said, who knew more about American words than Noah Webster? And, Noah decided, he needed to show where every word in English came from. So he studied 20 different languages, from Arabic to Italian to Welsh. He read almost every book in the local libraries, collecting words for his dictionary. He read almost every book in the Yale University Library. He started his dictionary in 1807, and 17 years later, 17, he was still writing. He needed more books. He needed the great libraries in Paris and London and Cambridge. In 1824, he took his notes and his son William and sailed for Europe. A year later, with a shaky hand, Noah wrote the meaning of the last word in his dictionary, zygomatic, adjective, relating to the cheekbone. How did it feel to be finished at last? It was difficult to hold my pen steady, he said, but after walking about the room for a few minutes, I recovered. When Noah and William sailed home to New Haven in June 1826, they were astonished to see crowds of people waiting to greet the author of the first American dictionary. Noah was ecstatic, filled with pleasure, delighted, thrilled. When Noah and William sailed home to New Haven in June 1826, they were astonished 
to see crowds of people waiting to greet the author of the first American dictionary. Noah was ecstatic, adjective, filled with pleasure, thrilled, delighted. Now, Noah needed to read the 2,000 pages he had worked on for almost 20 years to be sure there were no mistakes. Can you imagine proofreading 2,000 pages? Next, he needed to find just the right publisher. Last, he needed to take a nap. Ooh. In 1828, when Noah was 70 years old, his American Dictionary of the English Language was published. He gave it to America with these words. In 1828, when Noah was 70 years old, his American Dictionary of the English Language was published. He gave it to America with these words. To my fellow citizens, for their happiness and learning, for their moral and religious elevation, and for the glory of my country. Noah died in 1843 after a long, busy life. But that was not the end of Noah Webster. When the pioneers went west in the early 1800s, Noah's blueback speller was in their covered wagons. When the Civil War ended in 1865, the newly freed slaves learned to read from Noah's speller. Noah's Dictionary is the second most popular book ever printed in English after the Bible. It is in every library, in most homes, in our schools, and on our computers, teaching Americans how to spell and use and say nearly every word in the English language. Noah's Webster, Noah Webster's words did unite America. He always knew he was right. And that is the end of the story.